Welcome to the New Horizons Small Group. This quarter we are looking at the Explore the Bible curriculum and we're looking at four of the minor prophets, Amos, Jonah, Hosea, and Micah. So far we have finished our study of the book of Amos. We did four sessions on Amos. And this week we're going to finish our second session on the book of Jonah. Now, as we get started, this is going to be session number six in our study. The title of the session is No Compassion, and we're in Jonah chapter four. So again, this is the Explore the Bible curriculum, the books of Amos, Jonah, Hosea, Micah. We're in the book of Jonah. Session six, No Compassion, Jonah chapter four. Last week, we began our study of the book of Jonah, and Jonah, like the other three, are all considered to be minor prophets. Now, they're minor prophets only from the standpoint that their books are short, as compared to the major prophets. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., are all fairly long books. Amos, Jonah, Micah, Hosea are relatively short books. Now, Jonah, the book itself, uh, in verse 1, identifies that the author of the book is Jonah, but we know very little about him other than that. We do know from 2 Kings 14 that he lived in a little town called Geth Heber, which was about three miles from the city of Nazareth, and we know that he prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel under King Jeroboam II. But other than one short verse in 2 Kings 14, we know nothing about his ministry to the northern kingdom. Instead, the book of Jonah focuses on Jonah's ministry to the city of Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, who were major enemies of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, the book of Jonah is unique in that um, it's the only book where the prophet tried to run away from God, did not want to fulfill the commission that God had given him uh, to go and preach to a certain group of people. It's also different in that the book appears to be either biographical or autobiographical. And it's a historical book. It's about his uh, preaching to the city of Nineveh. But there's nothing in there that talks about oracles or judgments or uh, any other sermons. In fact, there is a short, like, seven or eight word sermon in the book of Jonah, and that's it. And that sermon or that warning is simply, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Very short sermon. Uh, judgment, no promise of hope or anything else. But the astonishing fact was the people of Nineveh, from the king downward, um, responded to it and repented in sackcloth and ashes, and God relented from destroying the city of Nineveh. We're going to see what happens with Jonah in today's session after God um, relents from the destruction of Nineveh. Now, the book of Jonah is divided up into two sections, and last week we looked at session, section one, which is Jonah chapter one and Jonah chapter two. Each section starts with the words, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And in section one, Jonah one and two, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And what did Jonah do? He headed as far to the other direction as he could. He went from his town down to Joppa, got on a boat, headed to Tarshish, which many scholars think was probably Spain, trying to get away from God's commission. God brought up a storm. The boat sank. Jonah was swallowed by a great fish. Um, eventually, he was spewed up on the land. And in chapter 3, the word of the Lord came to Jonah again and said, go to Nineveh. And this time, instead of running from God, Jonah reluctantly went to Nineveh. And chapter 3 is all about him preaching in Nineveh. So as we get started, I've got a question for you. You know, I usually start these sessions with a question. So here's the question. 
Do you have any prejudices? Well, most of the time we think of the word prejudice in a negative context. Doesn't necessarily have to be a negative context, although that's generally how it's used. If we're honest, we all have our own prejudices. So what am I talking about? Well, let's go to my favorite dictionary. Favorite dictionary because it's what comes up first when you Google a word. Now that's the Merriam-Webster dictionary. And for the noun prejudice, there are several definitions that come out right at the beginning. The first one says a prejudice is a preconceived judgment or opinion. The second definition under it says a prejudice is an adverse opinion or leaning formed without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge. So I said a minute ago, I have prejudices. So here's just a few of my more simple prejudices, okay? I do not like the taste of coffee, wine, or beer. I have tasted coffee. While we were in Europe, I tasted a few wines. I do not like the taste of either. I like to smell coffee cooking. I don't like its taste. And I really didn't find any wine that I really liked the taste of. I don't like the taste of beer. And I have no desire to try it. Uh, I have never tasted beer. But honestly, it smells to me. And I really do not even want to attempt to taste it. I have no desire to taste it. So there are two prejudices for you. I am prejudiced against drinking coffee, beer, or wine. In a couple of cases, I have had experience. In one, I have not. So my uh, opinion is based on no experimentation. Okay, here's another one for you. I do not like to watch or play cricket. Now, I have watched cricket. So I have some experience. I've watched it. I don't like to play cricket. And I have no interest in watching it. I've never figured out how the game was played. And lastly, let's try something else, something a little different. Uh, I don't like hip-hop music. And I have listened to some hip-hop music, and I don't particularly care for it. So, as I said, in some cases I have a, I guess I would say, unfounded prejudging of something, in that I have never tried it. In other cases, I have had limited experience, and I've still prejudged that I don't think I would like doing that particular thing. So let's look at one other definition of prejudice. This is the one probably we most often think of when we hear the word prejudice. Again, the definition from Merriam-Webster is, it's an irrational attitude of hostility directed against an individual, a group, a race, or their supposed characteristics. I guess that's probably the definition that pops into your mind first when you hear the word prejudice. In today's session, we're going to look at Jonah's prejudice against the people of the city of Nineveh. He had no experience with them other than knowing that they had attacked Israel before. And I'm not even sure that was during his lifetime. Don't know. Um, I haven't researched that part. But regardless, he had prejudged that the people of Nineveh were not worthy of God's compassion. And we're going to see how that affects this relationship with God here in just a minute. So again, last week, we had Jonah in the fish. He was spewed out, or I think the scripture says he was vomited out on the ground. He goes to Nineveh. In chapter 3, he goes into Nineveh. He preaches one very short sermon throughout the city. In 40 days, the city of Nineveh will be overthrown. People of Nineveh repent. And God relents and does not destroy the city of Nineveh. Then in chapter 4, we look at God's response, or not God's, Jonah's response to God's relenting of his um, destruction of the city of Nineveh. And shall we just say that Jonah wasn't happy about it? And we're going to see what happens as the story unfolds in this last chapter of Jonah, Jonah chapter 4. So as we get started, we're going to look at Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. And again, I'm reading from the NIV to start with, and then I'll go to the whole one. 
So Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tyrus. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Okay, let's look at what it says in the Holman version. Verse 1 says, But... So, some time has passed. In his sermon, Jonah said, In 40 days, Nineveh would be destroyed. The city repented, and evidently the 40 days have passed, and the city has not been destroyed. So, verse 1 in chapter 4 starts out, But Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. Instead of rejoicing over the fact that his sermon was received well, and that people uh, repented of their evil, and God relented and did not um, destroy them, Jonah becomes, depending on your translation, either furious, as it says in the Holman, or angry, as it says in the NIV. The word literally means it burned him up. He got so mad, he was red in the face. He was burned up. Now, Jonah could have a couple of reasons for being mad. First off, these were Israel's enemies. So, it was okay that God showed compassion to the people of Israel. They were his chosen people. It was not okay to show mercy to Israel's enemies. Second reason he could have been mad was that as I said a minute ago, Assyria was Israel's enemy, and they remained strong, and they remained a threat to Israel as long as they existed. Thirdly, he may have thought, well, if God destroyed Assyria, that would prove God's might, and therefore all of Israel's other enemies would back off. And then lastly, a little ego may have entered in here. After all, Jonah said in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. It wasn't. So does that make him a false prophet? What he said was going to happen didn't happen. Verse 2 says, he prayed to the Lord. Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled toward Tyrus in the first place. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to angry, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. So we're going to see a series of four questions as we go through this chapter. The first question here is asked by Jonah. The other three are asked by God himself. Jonah is not really asking for, quest, uh, for information, and in God's three questions, he's not asking for information either. In this case, instead of asking for information, Jonah is pleading his case. He's essentially saying, God, I know that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. In fact, Jonah is quoting back to God part of the Torah, part of the Jewish five first books of their Bible. This particular um, quote is found in Exodus 34, 6. He's basically saying, God, I knew who you were, and I knew you were going to let them off the hook if they relented and repented. Why did you do that? I didn't want to come in the first place, and that's why. Verse 3 says, And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So this is going to be the first of two times in this chapter Jonah says, I wish I was dead. He's literally so mad. Remember it said he's burned up. He's red in the face. He's about to explode. 
He's so mad, it's better that I would die. I can't live in a world where you have forgiven the Assyrians and where the Assyrians still exist. Now, this is not the only prophet that was so mad he was asking to die. If you'll remember back when we were in 1 Kings with the prophet Elijah, after their little incident at Mount Carmel, where he defeated the priest of Baal, Queen Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. And Elijah ran for his life. And one of the places he stopped, he said, God, there's nobody left for me. Just kill me. Well, there's a difference between the two. Elijah was literally afraid for his life. He was running for his life. Jonah, on the other hand, is just prejudiced. He has prejudged the Assyrians that they're not worthy of God's compassion. And therefore, if he's going to be compassionate on them, I don't want to live. Verse 4 now comes God's first question. And again, God's not asking for information either. Verse 4 says, the Lord asked, is it right for you to be angry? And again, the word that is used for angry here means to be burned up. So God is saying to Jonah, is it good that this is burning you up? God's not asking for information. He's really challenging Jonah's ungodly, uh, ungracious, and uncompassionate attitude towards the people of the city of Nineveh. Again, um, he's trying to get Eli, excuse me, he's trying to get Jonah to think of it from God's perspective. So let's move on then to chapter four, verses five to nine, and see what happens next. In the NIV, verse five begins, Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. Okay, so let's look at the whole one now. Beginning at verse 5, Jonah left the city and sat down east of it. Well, if you remember the map of the area, for Jonah to come from the coastline of the Mediterranean to the city of Nineveh, he would have come to the city of Nineveh from the west. So again, kind of like the first time, he's going as far from the city in the opposite direction as he can go. So he left the city to the east. And notice it says he left the city and sat down east of it. He doesn't answer God's question back at verse 4. God asked him, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah ignored the question, left the city to the east, and he made himself a shelter there and sat down in its shade to see what would happen to the city. So basically, Jonah left the city to the east, went and found himself a high place where he could build a shelter or a booth, depending on your translation, where he could sit and watch the city in the hopes that maybe God would relent of his compassion and would in fact destroy the city of Nineveh. Because after all, these were sinful people who were enemies of Israel. So just maybe God would relent and really destroy them. Verse 6 says, Then, so again, after Jonah built his booth and settled down to watch the city, then, the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up to provide shelter over Jonah's head to ease his discomfort and Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. Now again, like the great fish, we don't know what kind of plant it was. We do know it was a fast growing plant because it basically grew up overnight 
to provide shelter over the booth where Jonah was sitting. In this area, temperatures could reach as high as 110 degrees in the shade. So God was showing some compassion to his prophet who would not show compassion to the people of Nineveh who had repented. At the end of the verse, it says Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. And in the original Hebrew, the word for pleased or happy is the same word with a prefix that is translated as displeased back in Jonah 4, 1. Both of them, sympathize, both, both of them symbolize that this was a very intense emotion. Just as mad as Jonah was that the city of Nineveh was spared, he's just as happy that he has his plant to keep him cool. Verse 7 says, When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. So God appointed a fish to protect Jonah when he was thrown into the sea. God has now appointed a plant to protect him from the sun. And here in verse 7, God has appointed a worm to attack the plant and it withered and died. And again, we didn't know how, what kind of worm it was, but again, it had to be a very uh, voracious worm because it was able to destroy the plant in one night. It damaged it very quickly. And interesting here, the worm, the fish, the plant, and in just a minute in verse 8, the wind all responded to what God told them to do. They were his creation. They responded to his command. His prophet, who would have expected to um, respond to God as well, was not. He, in fact, was very unhappy with what God had done with the city of Nineveh. Um, verse nine says, uh, verse eight, and then nine says, "As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head, so that he almost fainted." and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Now, in this area, normally the winds come from the west because that means it's coming off of the oceans, the Mediterranean Sea, where it would be cooler. An east wind, a wind coming from the east, would have been a very hot wind because it would have been coming off of desert. So Jonah is now emotionally and physically hot and miserable. And at the end of verse 8, he says, it's better for me to die than to live. Now, he may have been just talking to himself, but he was so miserable, I can't stand this anymore. Just let me die. Then in verse 9, Jonas, our God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? So, just as God said, is it right for you to be angry about what happened to Nineveh? Is it right for you to be angry about what happened to the plant? Well, the first time, Jonah ignored God. This time, he does answer God. He is uh, so angry and fed up that he lashes out basically at God and says, Yes, he replied, it is right. I am angry enough to die. He's angry that God let the city uh, not be destroyed. He's angry that this plant that gave him shelter was killed. Uh, he's angry that God just has been himself. He is so mad, he wants to die. And this is the second time he says, let me die. Verses 10 and 11. This again is out of the NIV version, and then we'll go to the Holman. In the NIV, verse 10 says, But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about the great city? So in the whole one, it says, After... Jonah has lashed out at God and said, um, I'm angry enough to die because what has happened to me. Verse 10 says, So the Lord said, You cared about the plant which you did not labor over and did not grow. 
It appeared in a night and perished in a night. So Jonah, you got really mad at me because the plant that you had nothing to do with, that I created, that I sustained, that I allowed to shade you, it died. And you're more concerned about the plant than you are concerned about the people of Nineveh. And verse 11 says, Should I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left, as well as many animals? And the book ends. Kind of an abrupt ending. The book just stops with this last question. Should I not care about the great city of Nineveh with 120,000 people? Each of the questions that God raises here are kind of open-ended. I mean, they're directed at Jonah, yes, but they would also be directed against God's own people in Israel and Judah who would have read the book. For them, they were the chosen people. Everybody else was an outsider. So therefore, God has, has no concern for them in the minds of the Israelites. They were not a mission-minded people, if you would say. They were an inwardly uh, directed people. Jonah's trip to Nineveh would, could be considered an international missions trip. He went to a foreign land to a foreign people. The people of Israel and Judah, Judah were all turned inward. They had no desire to go to other nations. Yet God had told them back in the time of Abraham that they were to bless all the nations of the world. So the book ends abruptly. Should I not be concerned about the great city of Nineveh? Should I not be concerned about other peoples around the world? And while it's directed at Jonah, it also applies to the people of Israel and Judah, and it applies to believers today. Should we not be concerned for the great people of, and you fill in the blank. So let's close with prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson from Jonah. We ask that you would help us to be concerned, just like you are concerned, for all the nations and tribes and peoples of the world, that we might reach out to them, that we might give them your message of compassionate love, that they might repent and become part of your kingdom. For we ask it in your name. Amen.